Gurgle, thank you so much for coming to the Robert H. Jackson Center. Well, I'm a big admirer of, of Justice Jackson, and uh, so it's a real privilege to be here. So you are a double Duke guy. Yeah, I couldn't find my way out of Durham. <laughs> uh, just, uh, uh, does the name Tom Butters mean anything to you? Yeah, that's a familiar name, uh, but I'm... I'm He's troubled. the athletic director at Duke for, for many, many yeah, years. Yeah, that's exactly who he was, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and we had notoriously bad teams when he was the AD. <laughs> I, that was one, he was a source of some controversy about that. And so, in, in a bit of serendipity, he was a pitcher uh, of a minor league team in Jamestown, New York. So he would have, he started right here. There were other big names like Lucille Ball and Roger Torrey Peters. I've come to team. conclude the entire world passes through Jamestown. And, <laughs> and now it's complete with your, your arrival here. You, you wrote this book, Unexampled Courage, The Blinding of uh, Sergeant Isaac Woodard. There had to be a moment where you learned about the story. I mean, it was sort of an aha moment. Well, first of all, um, I did not set out to write a book about the story. The story wrote itself as I made what was really a discovery. Um, I was um, nominated uh, by President Obama in, uh, in late uh, 2009. I was confirmed in 2010. And I knew I was going to the Charleston, South Carolina courthouse where Judge Waring had presided for a decade. Um, Judge Waring was known as, um, uh, uh, he was something of an enigmatic figure historically. He was the first of the great courageous Southern civil rights mm -hmm. judges. Um, most of those, um, of those judges were Eisenhower appointees, were Republicans in an era where um, those who were members were sort of anti-Jim Crow and they were appointed throughout the South. Um, Waitis, J. Waitis Waring was a very different background. He was a Roosevelt appointee. He was a Southern patrician. His family dated back to the late 1600s. Multiple generations of Warings were slaveholders. His father, his father was a Confederate veteran, fought in the Civil War. And how did this guy go from being um, the bastion of Southern and certainly Charleston establishment to being this civil rights visionary? That, that was the question I had. And I read, there's some um, interesting work on him, uh, Richard Kluger's mm -hmm. chapters in Simple Justice. Um, and there, were, um, uh, there was a um, biography written in the 80s um, called A Passion for Justice. Um, but nobody answered the question. What changed him? What were the forces that converted, made this incredible transformation? And um, I wanted to know, answer that question. That was really, um, uh, and I, uh, I had access to his docket. And from that information, I identified a, case, a very odd case on his docket called Uni United States versus Linwood Shull. And it was the prosecution of a white police officer from Batesburg, South Carolina, for the beating and blinding of an African-American soldier by the name of Isaac Woodard. I knew nothing about the story. I never heard of the story. Um, I, probably the name of Isaac Woodard had probably mentioned, been mentioned by no one in the last 20 years. Uh, uh, and, I, um, and I began trying to figure out what was this case because a prosecution of a, a white police officer for a beating of a black man in 1946 was unprecedented. And, um, and I had access from some, some papers of Judge Waring. I found a letter from 1945 in which he indicated that the South needed to make progress on race, but it needed to make it gradually, not directed by Mrs. Roosevelt, he observed, not directed by national organizations, that was the euphemism for the NAACP, and not um, by the courts. That's 1945. He is what they called a Southern gradualist, which was we need to change things. It was the view of sort of the Southern liberals. We need to change things gradually, organically, and by that pace, never. Okay, it would never happen. And, um, uh, and by 1947, 
he is issuing major civil rights decisions. Mm -hmm. So I've got the time period. Something happened between 1945 and 1947. He went on the bench in 1942. He retired in 1952. So I, I've got a pretty, I got, I got a pretty tight window there. And in the middle of that window is United States versus Linwood Shaw. White police officers prosecuted. Cases to, is prosecuted by lawyers out of Washington. They did, as my book describes, a terrible job. They, it was a really botched prosecution. Judge Waring would let her say it probably didn't matter, you know, that, uh, and, uh, but he was never the same after that trial. And I came to learn that um, his wife was at the trial, and she had never, also had never had an interest in civil rights. And I read somewhere that he described his wife's experience at that trial as her baptism and racial prejudice. That's not something to say normally in 1951, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that language. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I began working on the hypothesis that this change was tied to, um, to this remarkable case. And I read the, the case was a, was a cause subleb nationally. And with the benefits of uh, Nexus now, we of the African American newspapers of the day, as well as covering uh, traditional mainstream media, I was became aware there were literally hundreds of articles. This was a major story of the day. It had just been lost to history, and um, and so I um, I called a, a historian I knew very well, who had written the seminal history on the history of the NAACP. And I asked her, do you know the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard? And she said, oh my God, Richard, there's, um, there are uh, thousands of documents in the NAACP papers at the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. I didn't have time to go through them all. Right. I mean, she says, you know, there are four million documents in the NAACP papers. And she says, there's something there. And of course, I, made, I hightailed it to Washington. And um, a, a wonderful curator there who had cur curated the papers was just bringing me out files left and right. And um, after, you know, the more I developed, the more I, the richness of this story, it was no doubt that um, I was on, I thought I was on the right path. And, um, and one day, um, an, a great nephew of Judge Waring's told me, he said, just in passing, he says, you might be interested in this. I thought, I thought you'd be interested in this. I interviewed a woman named Ruby Cornwell when she was 102 years old. She was a leading African, she was the African American civil rights matriarch of Charleston and a friend of the Warings, I knew that. He says, I interviewed her and she told me some stuff about my great uncle. Now it was his great uncle, but he never knew him. He never knew him. There were family separation and uh, over civil rights and he never really knew his uncle. And um, he said, would you like the tape? I said, of course, I'd love the tape. And one Saturday morning, people, someone asked me on the way here, how did you find time to write this book, which I haven't figured out yet. But um, I would go down and work on the weekends. I, I didn't do it during the week. I was too busy and too tired when at the end of the day. So I'm sitting there with headphones on listening to this tape. And in the middle of this interview, um, Mrs. Cornwell says, well, you know what changed him, don't you? I'm like, wait, whoa, what is this, you know? She says it was that Negro sergeant. He said it, it, was, his, it, was, his, uh, it was his baptism of fire. Wow. I said, a nugget. Yeah. I got it. You know, there it is. So part of this, just from a way of, way of background, you might want to tell what happened. You know, in 1946. Right, the outline of the story is that on February 12, 1946, an African-American battlefield decorated African-American sergeant by the name of Isaac Woodard from Fairfield County, South Carolina, um, was discharged from the Army. He was heading home to his to, to, to this small town, a small um, community outside of Columbia, South Carolina. He was dis discarded. He was discharged from um, Camp, then Camp Gordon. It's now Fort Gordon. And he got on a Greyhound bus, and he was being transported. It was one of these sort of it stopped at every little town along the way. And at one of the stops, he goes up to the white bus driver and says, listen, at the next stop, can I step off the bus? Because I need to relieve myself. And the rule for Greyhound was 
When you got a request from a passenger, you honored it. There were no bathrooms on those buses. But the bus driver was apparently offended that a black man would apparently ask him such a question, even one wearing his dress uniform with battlefield decorations on it and the sergeant stripes. That apparently did not matter. And, um, and he said, he cursed him, and he said, um, I ain't got time for this. And return to your seat, which was at the back of the bus. And to his utter surprise, Woodard responded, cursed him back, and said, speak to me like I'm a man. I am a man just like you. And at that next stop, he let Woodard off. Woodard got back on the bus. They didn't say anything. But at the next stop, this guy's fuming now. He, he stops the bus in Batesburg, South Carolina. He apparently now no longer concerned with his schedule. And he uh, goes looking for a police officer to have Woodard arrested and removed from his, well, removed from his bus and arrested. Woodard is summoned off the bus. He greets Linwood Shull, the um, the uh, police chief of a two-person force, and he he tries to explain that all he had done was asked to go to the restroom. And the um, police chief was no more tolerant than the bus driver, and pulled out a blackjack, which is a spring-loaded baton. They're illegal today. They're so damaging, cause so much injury, and. We know this because their FBI would later interview people on the bus. He strikes Woodard over the head with the, with the, with the um, blackjack, throat, turns his arms around his, his uh, back, doesn't have handcuffs, and escorts him away. And um, he, um, as he turns the corner, we've walked this path many times, uh, out of sight, he begins beating Woodard mm -hmm. with the blackjack, and eventually... Um, Woodard's on the ground, essentially unconscious, and he takes the end of the baton and stabs it into each eye. Then he hauls him off to the town jail another block up the way, throws him into a jail cell. When he awakes the next morning, he cannot see. He's blind. And um, this he, he is the, the subsequent day, they, they don't really know what to do with him. He can't see. They take him over to the town court, which is in the same building as the jail, and they convict him of drunk and disorderly conduct. He was not drunk. He was not disorderly. But he, um, he's then, they don't, what are you going to do with this guy? He can't see. And they take him to the local VA hospital in Columbia, 30 miles away, basically dump him on the, on the, do on the doorstep. And the word starts surfacing in Columbia, the capital city, um, to the NAACP leadership in South Carolina that there is this sergeant, blinded sergeant, who was beaten in the nearby town. And a um, local editor of the black newspaper there goes out and interviews him, realizes this is really unusual, and sends a memorandum to the NAACP in New York to Walter White, the executive secretary, mm -hmm. the most important civil rights leader in America of the day, Walter White was no fool. He recognized immediately this was an extraordinary story. And Woodard, he learned, was coming to New York as, once he got discharged, about three months at the hospital. Um, and he would be brought to the NAACP office. There he met the NAACP legal staff, headed by Thurgood Marshall. And they Im immediately recognized the power of this story. And, and uh, African-American newspapers began writing stories about it. Um, it, and then hit the mainstream media when Orson Welles, then, um, op, then um, having, he had a uh, once a week uh, national broadcast on ABC radio, and for four successive Sundays, he told the story of the blinding of mm -hmm. Isaac Woodard. And, and if you ever want to listen to something fascinating, just go Google Isaac Woodard and um, Orson Welles, and those four broadcasts are there. They are remarkable. And so the story is stirring, and, um, and Isaac Woodard is one of many uh, victims of, um, of uh, racial uh, violence of returning soldiers after World War II, because they had gone and fought for America, 900,000 of them. They returned home 75% to, to the South, mostly to the rural South, and they no longer wanted to uh, acquiesce to Southern racial customs.
So there were these incidents in a lot of communities. And in uh, September of 46, let's remember this violence is, uh, this event occurs in February of 46. The president has a meeting with civil rights leaders to discuss violence against returning veterans. And at that meeting, Walter White personally tells the story to President Truman of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. There are many accounts of that meeting describing Truman becoming beat red in the face, jaw clenched, furious that an American, honored American soldier would be treated like this. And the next day, he writes a letter to the Attorney General of the United States, Tom Clark, and he says two things in that letter. First of all, he tells him the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. The President tells the Attorney General of the United States the story. And he says th they, that the police chief intentionally put his eyes out. And he makes it clear that the time has arrived to act. What that means, prosecute. Mm -hmm. And secondly, he says, our problems are deeper. We've got to do more than this. And I'm going to appoint the first presidential commission on civil rights. It's prompted clearly by this session with the, end of, with the leadership of the civil rights community. Three business days later, DOJ doesn't move like this. Criminal charges are brought in Columbia, South Carolina against the sitting police chief in Batesburg for the deprivation of the civil rights of Isaac Woodard. The case is assigned to Judge Waring. And that is the part of the Truman, initial part of the Truman story. Now, there was a little, part of why you got that assignment is uh, this, there was a senior Timmerman, I believe his name was, uh, but he's... Was he didn't like civil rights cases. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he would f conflict himself out of every case. So Judge Waring got every case between Columbia and Charleston, which is probably 80% of the African-American citizens lived in that area. And so Judge Waring got a lion's share of the civil rights cases in South Carolina while he, while he sat. Um, let, let, let me, because we want to get to Judge Waring, but let me just finish on, on, on Truman. Um, Truman appoints this Presidential Commission on Civil Rights. And he said, I'm not going to appoint any segregationists. I am beyond that. We're not going to have a commission fight about integration. He only appointed people who favored the desegregation of America. And he appointed a remarkable committee. I described the committee in the book. It's just an amazing group of people. And, within, and he tells them, you don't got a lot of time. I, wanna, I want this committee to act. I want a list of proposals. And within 11 months, they write... Um, uh, a, um, a report called To Secure These Rights that lists dozens of proposals. Most of them required congressional action, which wasn't going to happen. But one of them really got Harry Truman's attention. The desegregation of the armed forces of the United States. He was the commander in chief. And in July of 1948, in the middle of his presidential campaign, he issues his executive order desegregating the armed forces of the United States. And a friend of his wrote him a letter, called him Ernie Roberts, and he says, Harry, you need to get off this civil rights. You're gonna lose the election. You've got to, let, let Eleanor Roosevelt handle these problems. And um, Truman wrote him back, a letter that the Truman Library gave me, with the, told me that the president had given the instructions to them not to be released until after his death. And he writes back, he says, Ernie, you don't know what I know. You wouldn't say what you said. He tells him the story of the blinding of Isaac Woodard. And he says, Ernie, if I lose the election over this issue, it will have been for a good cause. Never back down. Truman is a historian to himself. Back to South Carolina, the case is tried in one day in front of Jay Waitis Waring. He was skeptical about why was the federal government prosecuting what should have been a local case. Of course, there were never any prosecutions. Never, not one lynching was anyone ever convicted um, during this era or before for, um, for, the, um, for uh, hanging, murdering uh, a, a, a black man. But um, Waring gets this case, and um, he, um, uh, he's skeptical. But when Isaac Woodard 
is called as the first witness. He is ramrod straight. He's very impressive looking. Sunglasses on because he's blinded. Led to the witness chair by a bailiff. And he tells the story. And you know, you sitting in a trial, you know when someone's telling the truth. Waring knew it was true. But he looked over at that white jury, and my wife always points out, all male jury, and he knew they would not convict. And they did not. And his wife was at the trial, and few noticed that when the acquittal was announced, only deliberated 28 minutes, she left to the back of the courtroom in, in tears. Mm -hmm. And that night, they were together, and they both acknowledged they had experienced something in which they would never see the world the same again. And from that, they began, because there was no way to have a public discussion with anybody in Charleston about civil rights, about race and justice. That was off the table for the white community. They began their own private study of civil rights. They read um, W.J. Cash's Mind of the South. They read Gunnar Murdahl's 1,400-page book, The American Dilemma. And by the time they had finished the great Murdahl book, which I recommend to anyone, it's cited in Brown versus Board. He was later awarded the Nobel Prize. There was no turning back. And within a short period of time after this, he was assigned Elmore versus Rice, the so-called white primary case in which he, he came home and he told Elizabeth, his wife, he says, you know, we've been reading a lot, and talking a lot. Nobody knows how we're thinking. But if I rule for the plaintiff, our lives will never be the same. He was at the top of Charleston society. He lived um, south of Broad, the so-called SOB, the most, one of the wealthiest communities in America. He lived, he, was, he had everything uh, to lose and nothing to gain. But to do, and he, he would later say, my choice was either to be a, a captive of white supremacy or to be a federal judge and decide the law. So he issues Elmore versus Rice and he, in 1947, and he, say, he ends it by saying, it is time for South Carolina to rejoin the union and to adopt the American way of conducting elections. He ordered the party to enroll African Americans as members the party responded by agreeing to enroll anyone who would sign a loyalty oath. Only black people were asked to do this. You had to pledge yourself to segregation. Surprise, there was a new lawsuit. All of these are Thurgood Marshall cases. Uh, Judge Waring summons 93 members of the Democratic Party Executive Committee to his courtroom in an emergency hearing. Half of them were at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia. He told him to come home, and he um, wouldn't give him a continuance. And he told him that a federal judge faced with contempt has two choices, a fine or a jail sentence. And I want you to know that if you defy my order again, there will be no fines. <laughs> <laughs> that realization that Judge Waring was prepared to to, to jail white pe people, the most prominent public figures in South Carolina, to uphold the rights of black citizens, hit South Carolina political establish establishment like an earthquake. And he became a pariah. Uh, he became probably the most reviled w man in the white South. And he, um, he faced constant death threats. Uh, a cross was burned in his yard. Uh, uh, his home was attacked, bricks thrown through his window. Uh, he required 24 hours U.S. Marshal security. Um, uh, it, it was a, kind of amazing he was not assassinated. And, um, and that would have been an incredible story all by itself. Mm -hmm. But Judge Waring, and it was in all this intimidation, his lifelong friends would not speak to him. They would shun him on the street. He... Um, he didn't care. He wasn't cowered by this, and he. The more he read and studied, he became convinced that the granddaddy of Jim Crow, Plessy v. Ferguson, was legally, morally, and historically wrong, and he resolved that he was going to do his part to get it reversed. 
and he had a case on his docket from uh, Somerton, South Carolina, a little impoverished, one of the probably one of the 20 most impo in impoverished communities in America. And there had been a, brought a case, they were so-called Plessy cases. NAACP would bring cases that, that, um, uh, that would say we're not challenging separate, but we want equality, the so-called equality or Plessy cases. They were winning those cases because the practice, of course, Greg, was separate and unequal, not separate and equal. And so he was going to try one of these Plessy cases and on a Monday morning in December, in the late November, the Friday before the trial, they had a, a pretrial conference at the Charleston Courthouse. And when Thurgood Marshall arrived, court security said, Mr. Marshall, the judge wants to see you in his chambers. I'm sure he thought, what have I done? What's going on? He has a second surprise when he arrives at the chambers. No opposing counsel. And I tell lawyers and judges, ex parte alert. Okay. <laughs> and a big question here. Yeah. Ex parte alert. And um, and um, uh, he he tells he tells uh, Waring brings Marshall in. He says, Thurgood, I don't want to try any more separate but equal cases. Bring me a frontal challenge to segregation. Marshall says, it's on our agenda, Judge. It's just not tonight. This is not the time. This is not the place. What he was really saying was, they will kill my plaintiffs in Somerton if, I, if they challenge segregation. Just briefly, there's a pause for a second. The NAACP's uh, philosophy was to attack separate but equal, the whole equal. And in fact, it had significant success in the Supreme Court on that with an eye towards ultimately maybe bankrupting, if you will, the Marshall state. believed the South couldn't afford it. Yes, exactly. Right. You, ba you bankrupt them. Yeah. And that was the philosophy, but uh, your, the timing of Judge Waring, I'm being honest, I suspect of Waring, uh, at the time the NAACP had in fact met. And were actively debating that, and they had already resolved they were going to move away, but they, they were going to probably do it. Um, their, their strategy was to, to, tr to, tr uh, to challenge, they'd already been challenging as you know this, the higher ed, they've been challenging segregation in higher ed. And their plan was to go to colleges and then to go to high schools outside the South. And the last place they would have tried was Somerton, South Carolina. But here was a judge that Marshall revered. He, he greatly admired Judge Waring. And he, he was telling him, we need, you, time has arrived to attack segregation root and branch. This separate but equal stuff is got to go. Marshall says to him, I mean, Marshall, you're right. He, he's already, he says, Judge, it's on our agenda, it's just not tonight, which I think is about the coolest response I, you can imagine. And, and, and he says, um, Judge, you'll, you'll be reversed by the Fourth Circuit in Richmond if you do this. He says, no, I won't. He says, why is that? He says, because we're going to convene a three-judge panel because you're going to challenge the constitutionality of a state law, which at the time required a three-judge panel. And he, he says, well, we'll lose two to one. He says, you're right. That's exactly what will happen. But a three, an appeal from a three-judge panel is a direct appeal to the United States Supreme Court. No certiorari. You are on the docket of the Supreme Court. I've now sat on two three-judge panels. That's what happens. Okay, the Supreme Court, it goes on their docket, no control. And, um, and he says, Thurgood. That's where you want to be. And some people say, that was really risky, okay? But in Judge Waring's papers, there is a letter to Thurgood Marshall in which he says, I met with Chief Justice Vincent. He, I don't think I should put this in this letter. But you, you will find what I have to tell you very interesting. He had already counted the noses. Mm. He knew he had the votes. All he had to do get it there. to get it there. And he was reviled in the South, but he was revered. He was revered uh, in the judicial circles. He, and and he, was re, he was greatly admired by the justices for his courage. So they convene a three. He, he writes the chief judge of the Fourth Circuit, Judge Parker, and says, I have this request for a um, uh, challenge to the constitutionality of a uh, 
of the of the of the state constitutional requirement for a separate schools, and I request a three judge panel, which he would as practice would be to sit. In May of 1951, that, that trial is conducted in Charleston, South Carolina. The uh, majority, um, following Plessy, uphold segregation. Judge Waring, knowing he was writing a dissent for the ages, wrote an elegant, uh, an elegant attack on segregation, its illegality, its how it was unconstitutional, how it was unscientific, it was immoral. And he concluded by saying that Basically, the whole concept of separate but equal is wrong because segregation was per se inequality. That is the holding of Brown. No one had ever said it before. And in the, and in the great academic um, uh, um, discussions at Harvard and other places and on the, among the justices of the court, they were trying to figure out how do you untangle the Gordian knot of Jim Crow? And who figured it out but a patrician from Charleston, South Carolina, whose father fought for the Confederacy? You I can't make it up. It's such a remarkable story of strategy. It's uh, also one where when you didn't know that, probably as you're working through, you didn't know this uh, process. And as this is unfolding to you and you're seeing this strategy that a federal judge uh, kind of looking down the road, kind of fast forwarding a case which is the lifestyle in the South, changing it, to get a sense of what, what, what triggered it. I know he spent a lot of time thinking about it, so it was very emotional, but, but he had to do some really politicking if in fact he had to maybe talk to Judge Parker as perhaps here's, here's a stratagem, but also you know, Chief well, Justice Vincent. Well, he knew Parker, who he, by the way, John J. Parker, um, you may know the history, was rejected for the U.S. Supreme Court by one vote based on his civil rights record as a Republican candidate for governor of North Carolina in 1920. Parker always felt he, it had been, he had been read wrong. And later, Walter White would say it was the biggest mistake he ever made was opposing mm -hmm. John J. Roberts for the Supreme Court, because Roberts would then write a series of important civil rights cases, Parker, Pompey Parker, including upholding every one of Wade's Waring's decisions. He wrote the orders. He was an admirer of Waring, but Waring knew Parker would not stand with him. I mean, he, he, was, he, was, he knew that he was too much of a traditionalist to actually challenge Plessy. Um, By the way, I'm just going to pause for a yes. second. A little footnote of life that Judge Parker was, in fact, the alternate judge at the Nuremberg trial. Oh, yes, he was. I knew that. Yeah. And um, he, he was a fascinating figure. And, um, and you know, I'm speaking to the U.S. Court of Appeals judges in November, and I'm going to talk a bit about, um, about John J. Parker's role in upholding Waitis Waring's decisions. Uh, it's a, you know, the Fifth Circuit has gotten a lot of credit, deserve, well-deserved, um, for pioneering decisions, supporting Frank Johnson's decisions in mm -hmm. Alabama and other uh, cases. Um, but the Fourth Circuit issued some important um, decisions, the equalization of teacher pay in Virginia, and then upholding Judge Waring's decisions on the white primary and the, injun and, and the injunction he issued uh, that was the threat that he would, he would jail people. That was an injunction. And um, all was affirmed by, um, by orders written by, by Parker. And uh, so... Uh, Just have, again, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you a second, but during the, the three-judge panel, Parker's chairing that because uh, of his position, was there any sense from wearing he might, in fact, win? You know, he always um, held out the hope that he would, friend, he would persuade um, Parker. And let me tell you, the, the, um, Bob Figg, who defended the state, had read all those affirmances of Waring's orders. And he told um, Jimmy Burns, who was the governor of South Carolina, that if we go in and try to claim, as they always did, there really was equality, he says, we're going to push Judge Parker into Waitis Waring's arms. <laughs> 
we got to do something dramatic and different to get Judge Parker's vote. Mm -hmm. What they came up with was brilliant, was they announced the, a bond issue that would be the equivalent today of $700 million for black schools to equalize. And it got the one vote they needed, John Parker's mm -hmm. vote. And, um, and Judge Waring realized that once they had done that, he would never get Parker. That Parker was in, you know, the, 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 what, what is largely forgotten is the panel found the Constitution was violated. They just gave South Carolina time, which was, you know, they would, they would, they would do something 10 years from never, right? Uh, and, and that appealed to his moderate traditionalist view. Judge Waring always viewed that you can't give them an inch. You got to rule, you got to enforce. And one of the great lines of his dissent is he says, it must end and end now. And later he was interviewed after the Brown decision, Brown one and two. He says, how do you feel about, you know, he was sort of being viewed, he was viewed as the father of Brown. He says, well, I love the first decision, but they got it wrong when they gave the remedy of all deliberate speed. And he remembered, he, he reminded folks of his threat to jail, those folks, mm -hmm. Elmore versus Rice. He said they complied when they knew there was no tomorrow for them. And the mistake was, <clears throat> by delaying giving the South the time to resist, it took decades to finally desegregate the schools. Procedurally, <clears throat> Briggs versus the Briggs, uh, as you mentioned that um, Judge Waring had met with Thurgood Marshall, and ultimately he <clears throat> dis, uh, Marshall dismissed the case. And refiled. And refiled under a, a different charge, which of course was the... Uh, same, same plaintiffs, same, same plaintiffs. plaintiffs. Uh, and so the, the procedure before the court changed. Hence the constitutional law issue, the 14th Amendment issue is now, now in play. And that, that's he actually claimed that he implied it, <laughs> um, but because he didn't want the three-judge panel. He wanted well, just Wary to write an order. At least they'd have an order, you know? It was gonna get reversed, but they'd have an order. But Waring said, no, you gotta, you gotta squarely plead it mm -hmm. if you want us to rule on it. And he wanted the three-judge panel. Now that all plays out exactly as, as planned. Next thing you know, it's uh, 1952. It lands in the Supreme Court, subsequently consolidated with four other cases. It comes Brown versus Board. And then what <clears> happens <throat> to Waring? I mean, he's almost like as if Waring is worn out. Well, he's so ostracized. He's tough. I mean, nobody will speak to him. He's, he's a pariah in Charleston. And he's 70 years old, which, by the way, is, you know, in that era was a pretty late to be working, you know, um, uh, and uh, he... Um, By the way, we have a couple of Pennsylvania judges that are doing, they're working hard, man. Uh, I'm 68 and I'm not going anywhere, so, uh, uh, but Judge Waring, um, uh, was, you know, was, um, uh, you know, he, so he was emotionally, you know, he's very isolated, and he... Um, I think he wanted to be lifted from the restrictions he had as, as a judicial duties to be, frankly, more of a leader in the cause he had come to, to be very passionate about. And uh, they were going to move from, uh, from Charleston. And he, uh, he uh, uh, announced in February of, uh, of uh, 52 that he was going to, I'm, I'm sorry, I guess it's 50, yeah, um, yeah, 52. 52, he announces his retirement. I guess it's effective in February. He announces it in January. And um, he um, moves to New York City, where he was, a, he was greatly honored in New York. He was uh, a member of the National Board of the ACLU. He was uh, on the National Board of the, South, of the, of the Conference of Christians and Jews. Uh, he, uh, uh, well, upon his retirement, he helped edit the briefs in Brown versus Board. Really? Yes. Uh, he, um, he um, I have in his papers edits of suggestions to Thurgood Marshall. Uh, he, um, uh, and he was, um, uh, he followed closely the other cases. Uh, on the evening of, of the uh, May of, of 1954, May 17, when the decision is made, 
<clears throat> that evening, the leadership of the NAACP, including Walter White, come to the Waring's home and toast him. Wow. The father of prayer. Yeah. So when you talk about the per, per, the per se aspect of this, yeah. uh, which in fact then defined, I mean, that's, that's a piece of the history that's lost. I mean, that, that to me is what was said here in the dissent of Briggs is as important as what happened in the dissent by John Marshall Harlan in Plessy versus Ferguson. By, by the way, Constitution is colorblind. Judge Waring greatly admired Harlan. He yeah. was a sort of hero of his. Um, you know, but that's, I mean, that you hear about Harlan's dissent, that language, and here, Waring, other than your, your book, frankly. Let me say the words getting out. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why <laughs> yes. you're, I mean, that, that's an amazing piece of the story of the connect that ultimately finds form, if not the exact verbiage, that in, in Earl Warren's decision. Uh, by the way, uh, we, we, as I mentioned, your good friend, Professor Brad Snyder, wanted to uh, underscore that the main event in the Brown versus Board was, in fact, Thurgood Marshall's argument with John Davis in the Briggs versus Elliot, which I suspect uh, within some of that is Judge Waring's handiwork in the, in the briefing of Marshall. And well, you know, uh, Bob Carter, who argued Brown versus Board, right. who was his assistant, I interviewed for the book, and he said to me, Gurgle, I, I argued Brown versus Board. And I said, was that because Thurgood thought Briggs was more important? He says, exactly. Well, that was the main event. I mean, even at the, and that yes. was uh, the one where they, uh, Felix Frankfurter, hence Brad Snyder's keen interest, as the, uh, the whole book is about Felix Frankfurter, uh, and Robert Jackson were the only two that took on John Davis. You know, they just sort of let him roll. Uh, the Supreme Court did. I mean, I like, of course, he was the most revered exactly. a, a Supreme Court advocate of the day. Um, he was a, a you know, accomplished appellate advocate. And, um, yeah, it's quite a, I've read the argument several times. It's really quite an, a, an argument. And, you know, um, it's interesting, the story, you know, we're learning more and more all the time about how Earl Warren makes it 9-0. And, you know, Jackson was one of the people they needed to move over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Frankfurt was an important influence on him. Uh, they were, you know, uh, there were people in the court Robert Jackson did not particularly get along with. You go black, right? Uh, and then there were those he was closer with. And, um, and Frankfurter was uh, a key, um, a key uh, player in pulling over the more conservative justices. Yeah. Yeah, Jack Jackson, in fact, we spent two years on the subject matter, clearly was against segregation, but having, was having a difficult time getting the whole 14th Amendment. He needed, was, he needed some law to get to he, that. He was, like, you know, worried, well, it was historically allowed during yeah, exactly. the time segregation. How do you get around that? But he came to the conclusion, ultimately, that you've got to have a living constitution. You can't just be frozen in time. It's got to stand for something. And um, he was certainly not the last to come along. There were a couple you know, later, but once Justice Jackson came over, then the other, it made it easier for the others. Yeah, and then Stanley Reed was, was kind of the last one. In well, the Stanley Reed, Kentucky, he was the last to go. Uh, we, we had to benefit, just to the sidebar, we had to benefit of all those clerks of Brown versus Board here. And to have them talk after 50 years, they felt free to talk about yes. what was going on in chambers. And it was fascinating, just, just fascinating politicking. They kind of knew ultimately the result would be, including Jackson. They knew how he'd vote, but Jackson had to get there. He had wrote a, a draft concurring opinion. Yeah, let, let, me, um, let me give you a large uh, connecting the desegregation of the military to Brown, which is largely unknown. Uh, Harry, you know, Harry Truman didn't just order the desegregation of the military. He set up a commission to implement it. It's mm -hmm. called the Fay Commission. And, and this was a three-person commission, and um, they were all committed to, to the desegregation of the military. The Air Force and the Navy quickly had their plans for desegregation approved, but the Army, the largest branch, resisted vigorously and submitted, they submitted various proposals. The Fay Commission kept rejecting them. And finally, the Army brass went to see the president. And he told, they told him, that commission of yours is impossible. You can't make them happy. You've got to do something. 
Harry Truman said, you want me to abolish the Fay Commission? They said, yes, sir, Mr. President, that is what we're asking you. He says, you submit a plan they can approve and I'll abolish them. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And that's great. That's you know, there's great. another story about Harry Truman that he had nominated in a recess appointment, William Hasty is the first black mm -hmm. federal judge. He was, uh, uh, he was on the sixth, nominated to the, in a recess appointment to the Sixth Circuit and um, no vote. It just was, there was Congress would come to an end. And a group of senators came over to see the president because they wanted a bill to pass 25 new federal judgeships. And he knew those, he knew, he'd been a member of the Senate. Everyone had their former law partner in mind, right? They all had their butt, biggest supporters to be nominated for federal judges. If only they could get those judgeships created. And, Tr and Truman said, I think this is a wonderful proposal. And as soon as you confirm Judge Hasties, <laughs> I'm sure we can find a way to get this passed. And uh, they apparently within a week, William Hasty was confirmed as the first African American federal judge. I love it. Those are great. Um, one of the things that uh, is in Buffalo, and I commend you to this kind of piece of serendipity. There is a um, it's a Methodist church, I think, Mike. Right? African American. After AME, yeah, AME, African Methodist AME. Yes, and sir. it's uh, named after Joseph Delane. It's called the Delane Waring Church. Church, uh, which shows the connection between Joseph Delane, who was the South Carolina pastor who was very much involved in organizing the original petition, which led to Briggs. And could you talk a little bit about? What relationship, if any, between Delane and Waring? It was very close. It came to be very close. Reverend Delane was um, uh, was a, a AME minister and school principal in the Somerton School District, and he um, uh, was a very interesting fellow. And he had joined the NAACP and had gone to state meetings and heard various leaders talking about the need for action, and the. Um, uh, citizen, the black citizens of this little school district wanted some school buses. The white children, it was a very spread out school district. Some children had to walk nine miles to school, or they just didn't go. White children had school buses. Black children had to walk to school. And the white children, when they rode by, would throw rocks at the kids. It was awful. So the, the, um, the community got together and bought a school bus. It was an old used school bus that kept breaking down. And they asked, they went and said, will you help us with the cost of maintaining the school bus, hire a driver, and pay for the gas? And they said, no, Mom, we're, not doing, we're not doing that. And that led to the Citizens Committee, which eventually became the lawsuit of, of Briggs versus Elliott. And, um, and Reverend Delane, uh, when, when they filed the petition, was fired as principal of the school. His wife was fired as a teacher. And eventually, his, his uh, sister, his nieces, everybody connected to the family was fired. His home burned down while the volunteer firemen watched. He was constantly under death threats. He was an incredibly courageous person. And his home was attacked, and he shot back, and there was a warrant out for, some, for discharging a firearm. And he left the state and never returned. Never was he because they had this active warrant out for him. And um, and when it, and um, before those were the incident where he left, uh, he was he was known widely known as the one leader of the of the uh, of the group. But he technically did not reside. His home did not reside in the school district, so he could not be a plaintiff. But he was well known to be the leader of the group. And after the case was over, and Judge Waring had announced his retirement, he invited um, Reverend Delane and his family to his home for lunch. Mm. This is 19, late 19, December of 51. And, um, and Reverend Delane, uh, he, he brings his kids there, and I know this story because his son Joe has told me this story. And, um, and Judge Waring says to the son, uh, you're a senior in high school, where do you want to go to college? And his father said, he's going to Johnson C. Smith. 
That's an African American school in Charlotte, where Reverend Delane was then, uh, we had many relations. It was an AME, strong AME connection. And, um, and the son, to the shock and embarrassment of his father, said, I don't want to go to Johnson C. Smith. And Judge Waring says, where, you want to go to Howard? He says, no, sir, I want to go to Lincoln University, which is in Philadelphia. And Judge Waring nodded along. Well, Joe tells me that he got in the car after. He says, how dare you say anything to Judge Waring? Several weeks later, um, he gets a, a letter from Lincoln University awarding him a full scholarship. Uh -huh. Julian Bond's father was the president. Yeah. Of, of uh, Lincoln University and a friend of Judge Waring's. Wow. So then um, Reverend Delane has to leave the state in this but trumped up thing about the shooting, the fire, discharge of the firearm. And um, he moves to New York. And by this point, Judge Waring is in New York. And Judge Waring helps his wife get a teaching certificate and helps him get a church in, in uh, Buffalo. And they named the church for the two of them. Yeah. That's a remarkable story. And by, and by the way, you're, you're, this is, I'm sorry to be so personal, but he's, 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 he's just, the emotion of Judge Gurgle when he tells that story, such I can see it in his eyes. And, yeah. uh, it's, it's a great story. I mean, you know, some people um, become active in a cause, they, and they love the cause, but not the people, you know? He loved the people. Yeah. He, he, was a, he was the real thing. He made this incredible personal transformation, as did his wife, and he was the authentic item. Well, yeah, just uh, in anticipation, I uh, had forgotten, but we have in our archives this document called Briggs versus Elliott, Clarendon County's Quest for Equality, put out by Ophelia Delane Gona. Okay. And Joe's sister. That's right. She lives in Florida. And mm -hmm. lives in Florida now, and we were, she had up until a year or so ago was living in outside New York State in New York. Yeah. We're hoping to get her here. Um, and, she's getting uh, up in years. All of, yeah. all of them are getting up in years. But she's been here, and yeah, we did good. a long interview with her. But she, she writes about wearing in, in this book, um, Briggs versus Elliot. Um, she was at that, by the way, she was at that luncheon at their home. Was she? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I hope, I don't Mike, if that's in your tour to go to the church, but uh, it seems like a photo op. <laughs> ah, she's holding out, nice. Well, I'm, I'm fascinated with this whole discussion about Chautauqua. Maybe they'll invite me to come to, help, to give a talk. If he does, and I will, because you know you saw how he's holding out on some books that yes. he's not going to share. <laughs> By the way, we we found something for you. Uh, you, as you as you reflect on this whole thing, you've provided you, you've uh, to me you provided a great deal of new information to the story. I mean, the Isaac Woodard story, which leads to the, really the uh, emotional uh, aspect of, of Harry Truman, President Truman, and then, of course, Judge Waring's uh, epiphany, if you can use that term. Uh, and there's a lot, lot going on, which ultimately led to the story, which ultimately led to Brown, Brown versus Board, uh, which we continue to... Which, by the way, I think also the desegregation of the armed forces of the United States is an incredible, important step. Probably that and Brown are the two most important steps pre the active uh, movement led by Dr. King and others. These were two incredible foundational steps. And um, and what I was getting ready to say earlier, I, just, I got distracted, was um, that... Harry Truman desegregates the military. By the time his term ends, he 95% uh, of American troops are in desegregated units. It's the first fully integrated institution in America. And the Department of Defense does a study on the effect of desegregation on the efficiency of the armed forces. And it concluded this study, which was then still secret, um, was was in, in draft form delivered to the nine justices of the Supreme Court several weeks before Brown. Mm. That's not in the record, by the way. Wow. 
<laughs> another one of those, I didn't know that. The, uh, I'm going to tell you another sort of, these, these stories kind of cross themselves. After Judge Waring issued his decisions in Elmore versus Rice, he was invited to the White House by President Truman. <laughs> and um, I searched high and low to figure out what they talked about. Mm -hmm. And I finally found something. And it was Waring described this discussion. And he said his meeting opened with the president saying, Judge, do you know the story of the blinded Negro sergeant? <laughs> and he said, Mr. President, I tried that case. Yeah. Following that meeting, Judge, uh, the president wrote uh, Judge Waring and said, I wish I had more federal judges on the bench like you. Yeah. There's also a vignette. You brought up uh, Julian Bond's father. Uh, there's a vignette. Uh, I had a chance, also had a chance to interview uh, Dr. Bond, uh, but that th there's a connect here with your interview with Dr. Bond and Isaac Clark. Well, I had come across a letter Julian Bond had written in which he said that the blinding of Isaac Woodard had ignited the modern civil rights movement. I, I didn't know Julian Bond. I knew he was at American University in Washington and I found a home phone number for him and I got an answering machine. It was clearly Julian Bond's voice. And I said, um, I was working on this book and I would love to chat with him about this letter he had written. And within a couple of days, he called me back. He had been out of town. He said that I, and he, um, and I said, I, I told him, I said, you know, I, I, am, I am convinced that the blinding of Isaac Woodard inspired Judge Waring that led to the great descent and inspired the President of the United States to desegregate the military. And I wanted to know whether that was what you meant. He says, Judge, uh, my father and Judge Waring were very close. They knew each other very well. My father was a admirer of, of, of Waitis Waring. And I'm the former chairman of the board of the NAACP and I knew about Walter White telling President Truman about Isaac Woodard. But that's not why I said it. I said, well, why did you say it? And he said, well, I, as a child, my parents subscribed to every major black meat, um, um, publication. Newspapers, Ebony, etc. And in one of those publications, I cannot remember which one it was, there was a picture of the blinded Isaac Woodard. And I and people of my generation were riveted by that image. And as he's beginning to tell me this story, he begins to weep. Hmm. Now, I didn't know him. I'm on the telephone with him. I mean, he's weeping. And he says, please excuse my tears. 70 years later, I still weep for this blinded sergeant. He says, that is what changed America. Let me tell you, you will see that image right here on this book. You will read it and you like it. By the way, they wouldn't let me put it on the cover of the book because they said it would just, it would traumatize people too much. I could put it in the book, but I couldn't put it on the cover. Well, there's part of it. <laughs> and the rest of it is in the book. And you will be absolutely enthralled by a piece of history which Judge Kurgle has uncovered and presented to us for the very first time. And I am so honored that you joined us here today for uh, that which will be just a preview of what's going on at Constitution Day at the Robert H. Jackson Federal Courthouse. So well, thank it's a, you it's so a great much. thank you. And, you know, Robert Jackson was an important part of this, of this full story. So it's an honor to be here. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Kurgle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're a great interviewer. Thank you.